and welcome to another uh, class in the bunker here. Uh, kind of exciting, isn't it, when you start uh, hearing about people going back to church, uh, hopefully in some of the places where you live. Maybe the numbers are dropping and we'll be able to get, you know, up to higher numbers getting back to the church. Um, I don't know if there's ever been a time that the church has kind of been more in the wilderness uh, than it is. And, and yet here we are and we keep plugging through and the church continues to operate. And uh, if nothing else, it is a fabulous uh, way for us to see kind of how the, the brethren could foresee what was going to happen. And, and we're grateful for that. Um, now, as, as I read through all the comments uh, last week and I got comments from you, uh, pretty overwhelmingly that uh, we're going to be happy to jump into Old Testament and Pearl of Great Price uh, probably within the next uh, two weeks. And uh, that'll be kind of fun. I've got some new translations. Uh, there's been some great scholarship that's done. And hopefully we're kind of set to be able to do a pretty nice little deep dive. Uh, we'll see how far into the Old Testament that we go, but certainly as we work our way through uh, Genesis, and, Genesis and Exodus, there's so much to, to learn in terms of these promises of the fathers and where they began and why they began. And it will be a nice folding in of everything that we've done uh, over the, about the last four months. Now tie them into the Genesis get it, Genesis, uh, of, of where these promises actually began and why. So with that said, let's go ahead and, and hop in. Uh, again, always that plea. Let us know where you guys are coming from. Kind of fun to see each other uh, checking in uh, online while we're doing this. Okay. Now, let me, let me tell you if any of you have ever had uh, this experience. Uh, a few years ago, while I was setting up the family Christmas tree, I very carefully put the lights and everything on the tree and I was very careful about how I did it and it was just going to be a spectacular looking tree. And then I dim the lights and we have that moment where it's dark and now we're now the going to flip the switch and the Christmas tree is going to brighten into uh, reality and a new holiday has begun. So I hit the switch, flipped it on and my tree like looked like it was in stripes. I had a striped tree, light, dark, light, dark. Sure enough, there were certain strings of light uh, that weren't uh, on at that moment. Now, you and I know exactly what's going on at those moments. There's a string of lights on the tree and every single bulb on that string that is out is a perfectly good bulb. But there's going to be one little rebel in the mix that messes the whole thing up. If one goes dark, they all go dark, even though they're all perfectly good. And so I began the process of taking it one by one and unhook it, connect, and finally I hit the loose one, it all becomes light, and now we have the tree. Now, why it is that the producers of strings of Christmas lights decided to tie everything together so that if one bulb goes out, uh, they all go out, is probably a conspiracy under which you have to buy more strings of Christmas lights rather than taking hours during the holidays to try and figure out the loose bulbs. But I thought that that, that idea of the Christmas tree lights going out was a really nice jump off for a wonderful uh, LDS scholar by the name of Melissa Enaway, uh, who pointed out that for a lot of people, their faith, whether it's faith in the church, or faith in uh, just the gospel, or faith in Christianity, or faith in their church, is very much like a, a string of Christmas light bulbs. That they all seem to run together and then when one bulb goes out, it darkens the rest of a perfectly good set of lights. One bulb had destroyed the whole thing. And, and she points out, I think, pretty clearly that for a lot of people, there's a lot that they joy, enjoy about their church or religious uh, experience until they come across one little troubling aspect 
or a trauma uh, or a piece of information or a, a bad experience with somebody uh, in the congregation or in leadership and it seems to darken everything else uh, out along the string. And as, I, as I've thought about that, guys, I'm kind of aware that at any given moment, uh, no matter how deep we may feel like our faith in the gospel is, that in some ways, depending on how our faith is developed and how it's maintained, it can be a little more brittle and fragile maybe than we're even aware. So the dangers of having a, a brittle faith is the fact that it's really dependent on every link in the chain being as strong as the others because if one breaks then the whole thing falls apart. And because in, in a way, and, and maybe this is where some of the fallacy here lies, is the way that we have linked everything so tightly together around really fallible elements so that there are going to be weak links in the chain because we've created a chain and because of how that works. And we wonder how we do that. Well, on a... Uh, Sometimes in the in the opposite direction, here's kind of what we've done, is that as we look at the whole sweep of history, we're not we're not necessarily immune in our church to having this. Think about how many people start studying history and they go, well, I loved I loved my church and I love Christianity, and then I found out about the Crusades and they were cruel and they were killing people with the cross on their helmet and and on their shield and I just couldn't handle that. Or I believed in all of this and then I then I came across uh, the Spanish Inquisition and they were being forced to accept Christianity or what happened uh, with the the Mayans and the Aztecs as Christianity was being forced on them. And I'm not sure I can believe in a Christianity that did those kind of cruel, horrible things. Or a Catholic may say, I love the communion and midnight mass and everything that is beautiful about the different stations of the cross and, and my Catholic faith is important to me. And then I find out about the sex sandals scandals that happened with the bishops and then it rocks my faith altogether. And now rather than just say, this is a wonderful church with some problems, they go, well, I'm dumping the whole thing uh, and and then you start hearing the old saw well more fault and more wars were fought over religion than anything else so eliminate the religion and you eliminate the wars um, without looking at all of the wonderful positive uh, faith affirming things that religions have done because one one link in the chain gets broken and we throw them all it is, it, is a, it is true that so many that have left our church, for instance, very rarely, small group, leave to go to another church. Most become spiritual, meaning I'm not going to have any real religious affiliation. Uh, many become just agnostic, agnostic or even atheist in saying, because one link broke, I'm throwing out the entire chain because it was all uh, hooked together. Now, to a certain extent, brothers and sisters, part of this is on us. Because look, look at what we've done, and certainly this was something that, that I certainly did as a missionary. We tend to, if somebody's going to investigate our church, what is it that we're going to do? Well, we immediately start to build a chain with these links. We'll say, okay, now the first thing is, is that it's important that you know that the Book of Mormon is true. So that's why we're going to have you pray about it and get a, a personal revelation. And the Spirit has spoke to you that says, this is a true book. Now, by logic then, and by this chain theory, what we then say is, if the Book of Mormon is true, then what does that mean? Well, it means that Joseph Smith is a prophet because only a prophet could have produced the Book of Mormon. So if the Book of Mormon is true, then Joseph Smith is a prophet. What does that mean? Well, it means that what he taught and what he said happened to him really happened and was historical, which really means that we have the authority that if the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith is a prophet, then indeed 
John the Baptist came and gave, him, gave Joseph and Oliver the ability to baptize. And along with that, about a year later, uh, here comes Peter, James, and John with the greater priesthood. And, and because of that, all the priesthood rests with us. And if that's true, then what do you have against being baptized? So if the Book of Mormon is true and Joseph Smith is a prophet, and we have the authority, get baptized, join the church, and off we go. Come, come, ye saints. Now, here's been the fallacy on this. And this is where we found our weak links in the chain. Is that, as Elder Ballard has said, we didn't do a great job for decades in teaching the church's history. And in fact, we were very much dismissive of anybody who was asking about church history. And we would just say, no, no, it's not important to your salvation. Don't worry about it. You know, just read your Book of Mormon. Don't worry about what Joseph Smith did and those other wives thing. Uh, that's just not important to know whether the pearly gates swing up and down or side to side. Don't worry about the mysteries. Just worry about faith, repentance. And we, and we poo-pooed all of that. And Elder Ballard says, those days are forever gone because we need to understand that there was a lot going on and that our history is messy. Because what started happening, especially with the, with the internet and everything, is that we started to find questions uh, that were being raised uh, from documents and things really attacking Joseph Smith. And that he, in some ways, Joseph Smith is far more under attack now than he was in 1830 or 1840. Um, and and what it was a successful, what it successfully did was weaken that link enough that if we could break that, what they found is that if they can break that chain, break that link, then not only were people saying, well, if Joseph Smith was a scoundrel then we're not sure about the Book of Mormon. It seems to be pretty good, but there has to be an, another explanation for where it came from. Or if he lied about this, then he lied about that. Uh, and, 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 that and what we found is that for, we had raised generations in the church whose faith was brittly reliant on our history. And th that our history had to look like and sound like what we believed that it was. Change that history and it's like a stab in the heart. Uh, I, will, I will ever remember teaching in a gospel doctrine uh, class that uh, at Carthy's jail and the bullets are flying all over the place, um, that John Taylor was actually hit from behind that hit, uh, by a bullet that hit his hip and threw him bodily against the window pane at the back end of that room in, in Carthage, and that uh, his watch was cracked in the process of being thrown against the window pane. And, and I said, John Taylor had originally believed that a bullet had, had been stopped by that watch, um, and, and that, that had really saved his life. And as we looked at it now, we realized that had a bullet of those caliber hit that watch, that there's no way it would have stopped it. And in fact, the watch was never stopped by a bullet. And, and uh, a sweet little lady in my gospel doctrine class said, no, don't tell me that. I've always believed that. Uh, you know, you're like, you're messing with my history and the foundation of, of the things that uh, uh, I believe. Um, I was taught, for instance, growing up and then on the day of our marriage, we stood in front of the temple doors in Salt Lake, and, and I turned to my new bride, and I said to her, you know who's, who's, that that door stays locked, and the only day it will be open will be by Jesus. And Cindy says, yes, isn't that romantic that this is, he'll be the next person to open this door. And then we mentioned it to a friend of ours, and he's like, nah, my father-in-law used to work in the temple all the time and he went in and out of that door all the time and we went oh no you're messing with our history um, and and again we get those times when we have built our history on things and then it changes and those are light-hearted examples but what happens if you read other things that shake and it the testimony 
because, again, as I mentioned a number of times, Richard Bushman saying for the longest time, our theology has been our history. Change the history, mess with the history, alter the history, and you've not just changed your theology, but you might have undermined it, and you might have submarined it, and you might break the entire project. So that is left as more brittle than we might understand, and to a certain extent, we're kind of, by culture, complicit in building these, these kind of uh, uh, chains that set up for people to have a broken link uh, somewhere along the way. Uh, now, there are, there are two factors that I, I want to talk about that I think may uh, add to and add uh, strength to the, the brittle faith uh, problem. So let, here, here's the first one. As we were just talking about that in the building of our testimonies and in the building of our faith, um, we may be building our faith entirely on inspired but flawed individuals. At the very lightest level, we, we, I think a lot of us that have all had the, the experience of uh, people that have joined the church and converted to the church based, based on the strength of their missionaries. Their missionaries had a testimony. Their missionaries loved them. Their missionaries had charisma. Their missionaries taught them the gospel, understood them, loved them, worked with them, brought them into the waters of baptize, baptized them, got them there, and now they're shining wet behind the ear, standing there in church on a Sunday, and they find out that uh, uh, Elder Shlomo has been transferred out, and he's now gone. And I remember after my mission, getting a couple of phone calls in the middle of the night from people that I had baptized and they had a problem. And Elder Hinckley, who had loved us and been with us here in England, was now off and married and were kind of lost because we were kind of converted to him uh, rather than and being converted to the gospel. Well, our problem is, is that oftentimes we become, uh, in, our, our, we're building our faith on very inspired but flawed individuals. Uh, one of the ones that I was, I, I was talking about online uh, just this, this last week was that one of the, the great men, I think, in my history, and one of the things, or not my, not my personal history, but as I've looked at church history, I've always loved and admired uh, Brigham Young, read his words, been to his grave, uh, and, uh, and I'm always inspired by the work that Brigham Young did uh, in the early days of the church. Brigham Young was the one that after Joseph and Sidney had had to flee Kirtland in the middle of the night and the apostates had taken over the temple, Brigham Young was still there quietly, still painting the pulpit uh, that he had built in the Kirtland temple uh, and it, because he wanted the temple completed before he would then go off. Uh, to Missouri. That was the strength and power of Brigham Young's testimony. When we look at Brigham Young's uh, actions in regard to uh, allowing slaves into the, the territory of uh, Utah, and then the theology that went with that that then denied uh, black members of the church the priesthood, um, those were, both, those were both flawed mistakes. Those were both errors. And I believe with all my heart that on the day that Spencer Kimball and the Quorum of the Twelve were receiving a revelation that it was time that all worthy male members should have the priesthood, I believe with all my heart that Brigham Young was there. We know for sure that LeGrand Richards talked about the fact that he saw during that experience, he looked up and saw Wilford Woodruff sitting there. And he said, I believe that I 
was privileged to see Wilford Woodruff because I was the last person in the room to hear him speak. <laughs> Think about that. Uh, this is in 1978. But he said also he was the one that was involved in the other major uh, hinge moment in the church, and that was the, the, the walking away from polygamy, and it was Wilford Woodruff that, that did that. Uh, and I believe those brethren would say, yes, there's a time that we need to be able to change and make those alterations in, in great moments in the church. Now, um, this is one of those ways that we have done that. Uh, this ought to look familiar to a lot of us because Joseph Smith used the, the term that the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. And we're going to build all of that and here's the keystone in the Book of Mormon and then Joseph Smith is the prophet and that the Book of Mormon shows that Christ appeared in America and, and we tend to do that. Um, now, and, and then we say to people, remove the Book of Mormon and the whole thing falls apart. Now, it's my belief, brothers and sisters, and this may put me a little bit outside of some of this. This may be heresy. But I believe that Nephi and Mormon and Moroni would say, we are not the keystone. We wrote so that you would see the keystone. Because the keystone is actually Jesus Christ. And the purpose of what uh, the, the Jews wrote and the purpose of what we wrote was to prop up the true keystone and that was the Lord Jesus Christ and his act of grace in our behalf. And Mormon wanted us to know that because he made sure it ended up in the title page. That this book was to do what? To show to Jews and Gentiles that Jesus is the Christ. He is our keystone. He is the one that we rely everything on. Not on apostles, not on Joseph Smith, not on anybody, but on Jesus Christ. And that everything that has been done in the church is to bring Christ to us. That's why we revere Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and Mormon and Moroni. But they are pointing, don't, we don't worship the signpost. <laughs> we worship what they're pointing at, and that is Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is our keystone, then it no longer becomes based on a fallible link that may change as we gain more information. He is unchangeable, he is easy to be found, and prophets, and as we're going to go through the Old Testament, prophets all through the Old Testament knew he was coming and wrote about him uh, very clearly. He is the one unfallible, is that, if that's a word, infallible, uh, unbreakable uh, keystone on which we build everything. Now, to give you an example, I, I, I love this one. Do you know that there's a prophet, Jacob? Oops. Uh, Jacob, uh, in, in the book of, in seventh chapter, remember, he's arguing with Sherem, the, the Antichrist that's come in. And he's going to say to Sherem, uh, when am I that I should tempt God to show that there's a sign in this thing that it, you want to know that it's going to be true? And then he tells Sherem, uh, you will deny it because thou art of the devil. I will give you a sign and you'll still keep denying it. So the sign is given. Uh, Sherem is struck down. Uh, and then after he, he awakes again. Um, and it came to pass on the morrow. The multitude were gathered together. And he spake to them plainly. And then he does what? Well he denies the things that he had taught them. And confessed the Christ. Jacob was wrong. And Jacob makes sure that you have in his writings that he was wrong. Jacob could have edited that out if it was simply a matter of pride to say, I told Sherem he wouldn't ever accept the Christ, uh, and then he did. Oops, that's kind of embarrassing. I'll leave that part out. He says, no, I'm going to put it in there that I was wrong. I made a mistake. And Sherem actually did, after the sign, accept the Christ before his death. Okay, 
Prophets without egos don't mind knowing that they made mistakes. I still believe Brigham would stand here today and say, I never should have denied people the priesthood. And I could see over the generations the incredible pain that it caused them, and I weep when I see it. I believe that's the Brigham Young that, uh, that, I, that we will find in heaven. So, problem number one is when we build our faith on inspired but fallible individuals. We thank thee, O God, for a prophet who is pointing at the Savior. He says, don't worship me, worship him. Secondly, and I think this is another uh, issue that comes up uh, from time to time. We, we might end up having a brittle faith if we're expecting to find opposition in all things outside the gospel tent, but we're not prepared for the possible conflicts and the opposition of all things inside the tent. We're raised to believe that Zion is, is one heart and one mind and that we will operate as one. And then we're going to go out into the world and we're going to bring to this gospel tent people from all different political persuasions, diverse country opinions, variations on what's happened in their life or not, different parts of the country and the world. And they carry with them their life experiences. And we're also pulling into the tent a lot of mortals. For whatever reason, the, the church, our, your ward, is filled with flawed mortals that sometimes, shock of shock, may make a mistake, might be bullheaded, might be mean, might be uh, innocent on some things, might be naive, might be stuck in the past, might be looking always to the future, might, uh, might abuse their kids, might have been abused. You know, we have in this gospel tent people with all of these vast experiences different than us and our mortalness and our stupids and our mistakes and our our flawed ways of how we carry out our calling and the way that we have maybe raised our kids or the dumb things that our kids uh, have done uh, and and then we're surprised when there's opposition inside the tent even among our leaders and we expect this level of walk on water spirituality from a from a flawed earnest bishop who's doing the best that he can uh, but there really is no way to take a really a great attorney and suddenly make him a marriage and family counselor 10 minutes after he's set apart as a bishop and not expect some kind of learning curve from him. Or a farmer that we have made a stake president and now he's having to go toe to toe with somebody who has um, got their PhD in theology and they're struggling with a part of our history and we go, how come farmer President Jones isn't quite figuring this out yet? I'm shocked I am. Shocked that there's mortality in my church. Now, I find that it, one of the best ways to take a look at this is uh, Elder uh, Bruce Haven in, in uh, 1979 gave a wonderful talk at BYU, and you can find this, this talk still out there, and he talks about various levels at which uh, he would watch the progression. He said primarily of BYU students, but by extension it really is kind of to all of us. And, and he's drawing on another uh, great writer, uh, G.K. Chesterton, um, who had a parallel set of ideas about the disciples' journey in, the, in their maturing of their faith. And uh, Hafen, Elder Hafen talks about a level one experience where he says people, BYU students would come into BYU with, with an optimism. They were optimists. And I have called this a brittle optimism. 
These are the ones that would come in and say, I have a firm testimony of my uh, companions and how wonderful they were on my mission. And yes, by the way, I'm a newly minted uh, walk on water uh, return missionary and I, and I really know the gospel in full. And they're listening to somebody bearing their testimony, a sweet sister that says, I have a testimony of my roommates and, you know, the church is uh, true and everything is true. I know with every fiber of my being and, and this is the Lord's university and you get this bubbling optimism and the church can never do anything wrong. And these would always be the same people that would be writing, sending letters to the editor that we would always wait for the BYU Daily Universe. And they would say... <coughs> I am appalled that I heard my BYU professor cuss uh, while he was getting some lunch uh, at McDonald's. And, you know, I wouldn't expect this at the Lord's University. You know, there is this standard of bubbliness and everything should be wonderful. Uh, Chesterton says these kind of people will not wash the world, but will whitewash the world. Everything is seen in a very brittle, almost waiting to be shattered experiences. And I think a lot of professors at universities, quite frankly, uh, are anxious and kind of have, enjoy shattering this kind of brittle uh, uh, kind of over optimism in a lot of areas, not just in this. Um, then Hafen talked about that he would then see people go from that from level one to level two, and he said, and which was an angry pessimism. He said he saw that a lot in the law school at BYU, where people would go from ha having entered as a freshman with all this kind of brittle optimism to then having some education in the academy behind them and learning the law and then becoming just kind of angry. And they would delight in attacking the things that they had previously thought were the best because they were now educated and it was their job to tear all of that fluffy stuff down that fried froth uh, should be attacked. Uh, Chesterton talked about these people and here, here was his concern about people that were angry pessimists inside under the gospel tent. Uh, not that he chastises gods and men, which he does, he does chastise gods and men, but that he does not love what he chastises. Chesterton went on to say they had a quiet anger at their life and they thought that they had been duped and because of that they became angry and they carried that anger and they ceased to love. They were just attacking and just critical. Uh, and that left them in kind of an angry pessimism that for a lot of people they never quite get past. They're just angry about the way that they perceive things. Um, now, finally, um, Bruce Haven talked about uh, a number of people as their faith matures away from a brittleness uh, to what Chesterton would call level three or the improvers. And, and the example that Chesterton uses is kind of, kind of beautiful. He says, he talked about that people would complain that some women were uh, as wives were married to these uh, cruddy guys and they would say, ah, well, love is blind. Only she would love him. And Chesterton's response to that was, love is not blind. That is the last thing it is. Love is bound. And the more it is bound, the less it is blind. He said, these women that love these men are the first ones to tell you where their flaws are. But they're also engaged in the process of trying to help them become better. And I think the goal, if we, if we move outside of the brittleness, our goal, I think, would to become improvers. We can attack the bishop over his obvious flaws or blind spots. How often are we involved in trying to help the bishop improve the areas 
that he has blind spots in. How often are we then willing to become part of the solution, not just part of bringing up and raising issues? How much greater would it be for those that have been protesting to be able to now take that drive and that passion and the things they've been protesting about to say, now let's work within the system and make things better rather than just try to destroy an attack. We want to become improvers, I think, over the, over the long haul. And that's the idea. That moves us out of brittleness and actually puts us on the front lines of wanting to help make changes inside the gospel tent. I'm always sad when, when uh, people tell me that they have left the church or they're thinking about leaving the church. And, and my, my thought is always, no, we need your voice. Please don't take your voice and go somewhere else. Even if that voice sounds different from everybody else in your Relief Society. We need your voice. And we need to be better at being open to those other voices. Not because they're a threat, but because, as Joseph Smith said, uh, in, in proving opposites is the truth made manifest. The idea of understanding that there are opposite viewpoints means that that's how we will better get to the truth because we'll have both sides of an issue. And somewhere between that path is an improvement and a change that's de desperately needed. And to do that, we can't see the gospel as a linked chain where one bad link brings down the whole project. We just can't. We can't. So, here's the goals as I look at it. And this is just simply uh, my ideas and, and you're welcome to, to comment on, on whether you think I'm way over the pale here or whether this is something that, some ideas that we really need to be thinking about. Here's the goals that I believe will help reduce the amount of brittleness sometimes in our faith. I believe, uh, actually to use uh, Melissa Inouye's um, uh, phrase, that we need to see the church as a living, breathing organism. It is a living, breathing thing. It is ever growing and it's ever learning. And continuing revelation means just that, that we will receive, continue to receive revelation, which will oft time change the way we did things, but oft times it may even change our theology a little bit because inspired people did the best they could to understand the gospel program and may have misunderstood given the amount of light and knowledge they had. Let's not be threatened when inspired revelation not just changes the amount of time we spend at church, but in some ways that we see uh, the gospel or the priesthood or a lot of other things where we may see uh, important changes made as more light is received to inspired men and women uh, who will then try and guide and direct on the new received light that has been given to them in response to a problem. Second one, I believe that over time mistakes of our past will be slowly recognized and changed. Not, we can't necessarily change the mistakes but we can certainly change our dialogue. A number of you have, have struggled a little bit as you've read the second volume of Saints and it's like, well, boy, there's some, man, there's some uncomfortable topics here. And the church is saying, yes, we need to be having conversations about those difficult topics. Inspired and wonderful leaders of the past will now hopefully be seen as flawed, yet inspired and loved. It doesn't have to drag our testimony down to believe that Brigham Young 
made some mistakes along with his fantastic victories and revelations. It makes him mortal. It makes him part of us. And I believe again that Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or Orson Pratt or Orson Hyde would be the first ones to say, I missed on this one. And this is more accurate. And what President Nelson is now doing is an improvement on what I said. And they would be the first ones in line to say, don't hold me up as infallible. Please. Hold me up as somebody who did the best he knew how to do. With all my warts. And they would be the first ones, I think, to ask for mercy and forgiveness for anything that they might have done whose doctrine or policies may have been painful. Finally, I believe that a diverse church culture must be ready to embrace all levels of growth an opinion, even if it's different from ours. How do we love and accept those that believe differently or vote differently and yet draw them close and say there are things to be learned from both sides of this argument? Again, the number one reason that women leave the church is that they feel judged in Relief Society and part of that is their own, they're, they're allowing themselves to feel judged, but there are times that their comments may feel a little bit out of line with the general direction. Well, that's another voice in the chorus. Let's not run those voices off. Now, how do we do that? Easy. Jesus Christ need, and his teachings need to be our standard. Everything we do or teach must be measured against him and against his teachings. We study him. The church is changing the artwork in all, of the, in all of our buildings to reflect our central focus on Jesus Christ. We're going to study him and try and understand him and follow him. And any questions that we have need to be brought up against the standard of what do we know, what did he teach, and how did he do it. Finally, uh, let me mention one other thing and then we will be done. I think as, as we take a look at our church organization as a whole, it should reflect the brittle faith that sometimes we have in ourselves. Just like our church organization, we ourselves are a mix of things like kindness, where we were kind, and successes, but that's mixed with our stupids. That's mixed with our failures. That's mixed with our sins. We are a mix. We're a, this is a, there, we're a mass of all of these. Can you imagine if we, if we looked at our life the way that we sometimes have held the church to, to say, I'm going to take somebody in their life, and because of that sin at 16, it will then invalidate everything before that moment, and it will invalidate everything that they did after that life because of that mistake, that weak link, that weak moment in their life. Rather than seeing the aggregate, seeing the entire picture and saying there is some goods and some bads and some stupids and some successes, and it's part of the entire picture. Turn out one of those lights and the all, all the lights stay burning. We're not reliant on one single bulb that will take out the entire string of lights. That kind of brittleness is scary. But put that against a living, breathing, revealing, evolving organism that is the church and is us. And I think it's easier for us to accept the whole thing and work on becoming not criticizers, not those that would exit, but those that will stay 
and help improve in the long run. My brothers and sisters, I bear you my testimony that the Lord intends us to have a dynamic, growing faith that is not shocked by opposition, but is able to keep moving forward and grow and learn from those conflicts that may arise in our understanding and in our own life. I bear you my testimony that that's what the Lord intends, and I leave that with you in Jesus' name. Amen.